Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit upon me, upon us. Lord, enlighten our hearts and minds to the beauty of your love for us that you showed us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, bring our hearts and, 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 and our imaginations into this baptismal service that we don't see things with human eyes, Lord, uh, that, we, that we see water as your cleansing, as the blood of your Son. We see water as the Holy Spirit totally saturating J.D. in the same way, Lord, that you saturate us. Lord, make this words not just be some story from history, but a story of your power and your love and the, and the extent that you would go to rescue us sinners. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That was my clue to stop praying. <laughs> it's important we have these things. So, yes, so, so today, like I said, is a special day. We are beginning the season of Lent and our backbone scripture for this season of Lent, these next six weeks leading up to Palm Sunday, leading through Holy Week, leading up to, of course, Easter. Our, our backbone is going to be the prophet Zephaniah. Well, we're not preaching from a, from a Zephaniah, but, but what we are going to do is expound upon our theme for this Lent, which is repent and believe. Repent and and believe. Well, there are lots of, of course, academic ways to define repentance, right? It's turning away, it's metanoia, it's, it's stopping going this way and then going this way. But one of the joys that we have of actually having a baptism is we're literally going to watch what repenting and believing looks like, right? Because we are physical beings, not just spiritual beings or intellectual beings, because we we have bodies and we have nerve endings, we have sensory, we have hot and cold senses. JD, of course, is going to get a big lesson in, in, in how his nerves receive the cold, okay, as he's baptized outside. Um, the, the Lord's generous to us, and he gives us these things which we call sacraments. They're outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual truths. And one of those sacraments is, of course, being dunked in the water, now, that means all kind of things, but let's talk about repentance first. Well, repentance, if, if I was to say it, well, you know, you know it's, it's a summarized here. I'm going to ask uh, J.D., do you turn away from your sins, the devil, and all evil? Well, of course, that turning away is the key, right? That turning away is, is at the heart of of it. The idea is that J.D., before he even um, uh, uh, was born into this world, when, when he was still in his mother's wound, uh, a womb, had a wounded heart. And his heart was wounded because, and J.D. is an excellent young man, but J.D., like all of us, just simply doesn't understand why the world doesn't revolve around him. His parents have seen this, just like my parents saw this and continue to see this in me. All of us have this heart that's turned in on itself. So actually, in repentance, what I want us to um, look at here very closely is that there's actually, when before you repent, you still have faith. You have faith in something. You have faith in yourself. I'm my own savior. I'm the center of the universe. I'm the most important thing. Now that manifests itself. Parents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody in any kind of relationship, be it a friendship or any kind of, knows that, that the other one is the most selfish person you've ever met. And so what, what repentance is doing is it's actually cutting to the heart of, of really what this selfishness is all about. What this selfishness that we need to repent of is all about is that I don't need a savior to make myself lovable and acceptable to God. I can do that all by myself. And we do this in one of two ways. The first way is the rebellious way. I'm going to run away from, from you, God. I think you're made up. I don't think you're real. I think you're a product of a system that wants to control me and all these things. And so I'm just going to live life the way that I want to. 
And I'm just going to be happy with myself. But you see, there there's faith in the self where we're trying to make ourselves lovable by making our own decisions. But then there's the scarier way. And I'd say in this Mount Pleasant culture, which is we're all, you know, we're all very, you know, we're, we're, we're achievers, we're smart, we're, you know, we, we have checklists, we're, we're a people of checklists in Mount Pleasant. Um, we take another tactic, which is actually even more dangerous because it looks holy. I'm going to do everything right. I'm going to show up on time. I'm going to pay my taxes. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to come to church on Sundays. I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to do all these things. And by doing them, I will make myself lovable to God. By doing all these things, yeah, I know I'm a sinner, but I can actually clean up my own soul by my good deeds. And then God will have to love me. Well, like I said, the problem with that, why that's more dangerous, is that it has the appearance of holiness, doesn't it? But actually, it's rotten on the inside. Because once again, where are we putting our trust? We're putting our trust in ourselves, in our actions to rescue us. Well, I'm trying my hardest. Don't I deserve some reward for that? That's still putting trust in ourselves. And so when J.D., who by God's grace has come to realize those are awful ways to try to live your life. You're constantly failing. You're constantly alone. You're constantly underneath the burden of the judgment of the world. You feel like you're constantly failing God and you're constantly failing yourself and you're condemning yourself. And where does Satan fit into this picture? He doesn't cause us to sin. What he does is he says, keep doing it. You can do it. You're strong enough. You can make it happen. Don't listen to those pe people. Hamilton doesn't know. Well, that's, that's actually probably true. I really don't know what I'm talking about most of the time. But the other ones, all these lies he tells us, you can do it. You don't need God's help. You don't need a savior. Or just go do your own thing, man. They're all here to control you and abuse you anyway. And so when J.D. stands up and I ask him right here, J.D., do you turn away from your sins? It's not just what he does, but what he thinks, what he wants, right? Sin starts with our wants, wanting to be our own God, wanting to make a plan for our own life, wanting to live a life without God con controlling it. Do you turn away from the devil? Do you call him out as a liar as he really is? And all evil, all the things which stray, that, that point us towards love of self over love of God, which means love of our neighbor. And J.D. is going to make a promise and say something really powerful, which the Spirit will empower him to actually do. But he says, I turn away from them all. That's repentance. Now, the frustrating part about this is that as much as as sincere as J.D. is, and he's incredibly sincere, one of the things I love about young adult baptisms is J.D.'s taking Christ as his own. I believe in infant baptism. I think God's at work there. But it's fun to see in the young man who has heard about Jesus and, and simply said, I want to be in Jesus' family. I want to be with him forever. I want to know the joy of his forgiveness. Those are his words. So with great sincerity... He's going to say this phrase, I turn away from them all. But if we're honest, that turning away may not be enough. Because for this repentance to truly take hold, it has to be 100% sincere. In the same way, turning towards Christ is taking the trust off yourself and putting it perfectly in Jesus. Trust, most importantly, you're trusting that he will do the work to forgive you of your sins and to get you to be with him in everlasting life. That he will do the work, that any obstacle of sin that you throw up in heart, um, in, in, in word or, or deed or feeling, 
will be cleansed forever. And again, for that to work, it must be 100% sincere trust. And if I was to end here, it would be a terrifying thing to be baptized, wouldn't it? But that's why we have our scripture reading. You know, what we have in our scripture reading from from today is a fascinating thing. It's Jesus himself being baptized. Well, what what do Christians believe? We believe that, uh, that the person of Jesus was fully man, born on this earth, as human as we are, fully God, right? Eternal in that sense. It's, it's a mystery. We don't know how it works out, okay? But that he was free of sin. And if you're free of sin, you don't need to repent. So why in the world? And, if you, and the way that we repent is through baptism, right? That's our outward and visible sign. Well, so why in the world? If Jesus was without sin, why did he get baptized? And of course, the context of the scripture is you've got John the baptizer. He's calling all the people of Israel, even though they were born Jewish and in God's family, their genealogy wasn't enough. They had to have repentant hearts towards God. So he was calling on them to be baptized, to be submerged, symbolically cleaning you of your sin, making you ritually clean. And so Jesus walks down and says, John, baptize me. And he says, why? You should be baptizing me, Lord. And he says, no, baptize me. And when he was baptized, and that word just simply means to go underneath the water, be totally saturated, right? Not just to get you clean, but the water also represents God's Holy Spirit filling you. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. And and the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven and said, You are my beloved Son, and with you I am well pleased. Well, what does that have to do with us? Jesus and his heavenly Father and, and the Holy Spirit, all three God, knowing that our repentance, even in our most sincere moments, would always be tainted with a bit of our sinfulness, said, you know, as part of their salvation, they can't repent perfectly. So Jesus says, I'll repent perfectly for them. And so when Jesus showed up at, at, the, at the river, at Jordan, and he went underneath the water, he had me, he had J.D., He had every person in the world, past, present, and future, on his heart and mind. And he was saying, God, I am sorry for sin. And he did it perfectly on our behalf. We can have an imperfect repentance even in our most sincere day because Jesus had a perfect repentance for us on his baptism. Likewise, when he came up out of the water, Jesus had a perfect trust in his heavenly father and the promises of his father that even though he will be forsaken by him on the cross, that he will be raised up on the third day. The only proof that Jesus had that that would happen was his heavenly father's promise. But he trusted perfectly. And that perfect trust is given to any of us with the mustard seed of faith in Jesus. We're we're accredited with it. God accepts Jesus' faith on our behalf. So my mustard seed of faith, J.D.'s mustard seed of faith, your mustard seed of faith is a sign that Jesus has had perfect faith for us. And what's the great gift? That just as the Heavenly Father, because of the sincere repentance and trust of Jesus, looks at him and says, you are not just my son, you are my beloved son, the apple of my eye, the joy of my heart. 
Jesus says that, or the Heavenly Father says that to JD today. Says that to all of us who repent and believe. One quick application for all of us, whether you're a believer or not. Right now, do you really believe? I've already stopped. It's not going to be perfect. Don't worry. But with the mustard seed of faith, do you trust that you are God's beloved son or daughter? The same status as Jesus with the same love. And, and it is a status just like your normal sons and daughters that you cannot lose by your choices, by your behavior, by your mistakes, by your intentional re- rebellion. You're his child forever. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never repented and believed because you're afraid that repentance meant you had to work really hard to make God love you, then we have good news. That's not Christianity. Every other religion says that. Jesus doesn't. He says, I've done the work for God to accept you. Trust in me and let that love shower over you and rest in my finished work. There are those of us here who have accepted that, but when we look at our sins, when we look at our failures, when we look at all the things in our list that we haven't checked off, we say, have I forfeited this place with him? I'm a terrible child. So am I. I'm the president of the terrible child of God club. We meet every Sunday right here, right? To be reminded that nothing has changed. We're still his beloved. He still rejoices in you. And so this day, as we remember the power of repentance and belief, let's take home the fruit of that, which is that not by our perfect repentance and belief are we saved, but by Jesus' perfect repentance and belief on our behalf we are saved. And as such, we are joyfully welcomed in as his beloved sons and daughters. And this is good news for us sinners indeed. Amen.